All right, so as promised, neurotransmitters. There are a wide variety of neurotransmitters in both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Lots of different functions for this myriad neurotransmitters. Now, we're not going to talk by any means about all the different neurotransmitters that we'll find. But one of the important things to remember is that what a neurotransmitter does, the action of the neurotransmitter, depends on the receptor. What you'll find is that one neurotransmitter will have different functions in different places. A neurotransmitter may be uh, excitatory in one place and inhibitory in another. Now we're going to talk about some major neurotransmitters here. Again, by no means are we going to be talking about all of them. The first neurotransmitter that we'll talk about, we've already actually spent some time with. And that is acetylcholine. I'm having a hard time with this. So acetylcholine is actually the first discovered neurotransmitter. It is found in both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. It was discovered in the Eighteen hundreds, nineteen early nineteen hundreds, somewhere in there. But we didn't understand what it did until nineteen twenty one. The whole concept of neurotransmitters wasn't a thing until nineteen twenty one. Before nineteen twenty one, the idea was something called nervism, meaning that. Uh, the brain was directly connected to every single cell in your body. And it directly controlled things, like through a, a system of on and off switches, through the action potential, basically. In 1921, scientists did an experiment where he took a frog and... Um, stimulated a nerve called the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10 we'll look at later. And when he stimulated that nerve, the heart slowed down. Well, the prevailing idea of the time was that it was the electricity. It was the electricity in the nerve that was making the heart slow down. Well, he flushed the heart with a like a saline-ish solution, remove that fluid from the frog's heart, toss that frog in the garbage, I guess, got a new frog, cuts the new frog open, opens up its chest, its heart's beating, and he just drops the fluid in that. The second frog's heart slowed down as well. What that showed was that it wasn't the electrical thing that was making the heart change its rhythm. It was a chemical that was being released because of the electrical activity. It was a secretion from the nerve that was making this happen, and that secretion is acetylcholine. It is widespread throughout the body. It's one of the most important neurotransmitters. As we've seen, this is the neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction. 
It's excitatory at the neuromuscular junction, but it also slows down the heart. It's inhibitory at the heart because we have different types of receptors. Now, things you should know about acetylcholine. Acetylcholine tends to open an ion channel. That means its receptors are ionotropic. Ionotropic means it opens an ion channel. Acetylcholine, like I said, it's very widespread. It's very variable. Um, you should remember that it's removed by acetylcholinesterase, which we've talked about. And let's see. Root by acetylcholinesterase ionotropic at the neuromuscular junction. We'll talk about the different types of acetylcholine receptors uh, later. Um, not all acetylcholine receptors are ionotropic. Thus far, the ones we've talked about are, but there are metabotropic acetylcholine receptors. Um, more on that later. There are lots of places we'll find this. Um, and we'll talk about some neurotoxins that affect acetylcholine when we get through toxins and, and drugs. But there's acetylcholine, the first discovered neurotransmitter. It's actually in a class all by itself. So now let's talk about our other classes of neurotransmitters. One of the first major class we'll talk about are the amino acids. The amino acids include glutamate, aspartate, Glycine and GABA. Also, uh, serine, but I'm not really concerned with that one. These are the four major ones. So, the amino acid neurotransmitters are found in the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. Glutamate and aspartate will tend to have excitatory receptors. Lysine and GABA will tend to have inhibitory receptors. Let's talk about that concept, excitatory and, in and inhibitory. Like we looked at with the sparkler example, excitatory means that we're moving it toward the threshold. And inhibitory means we're moving it away from the threshold. In terms of your cells, excitatory is going to be more positive, and inhibitory means we're going to be making the cell more negative. Now these have ionotropic receptors as well. Just they're opening an ion channel. So these excitatory neurotransmitters are most likely going to be opening ligand-gated sodium channels. Whereas these get inhibitory are going to open ligand-gated chloride channels. Let's take a look at a GABA synapse, GABAergic synapse. So here's our presynaptic neuron. Here's going to be our postsynaptic neuron. We'll have GABA receptors there. GABA gets released out here. So when GABA binds to its receptor, it's going to open these ion channels, which are 
apply again, gated, chloride channels. Chloride is negative. And if we move the cell potential, the resting membrane potential, down, that is inhibitory. We're moving it further away from the threshold. That distance to the threshold, to negative 55 millivolts, is more. It takes longer. It would take more positive ions coming in to get to negative 55. How does that play out in your nervous system? Well, what we're doing is we're inhibiting a neuron from firing. We're stopping a neuron from firing. Now, don't think of it as like unconsciousness or not working. You don't need all the cells in your brain to fire simultaneously. That's a seizure. So there are cells in your brain that you don't need doing anything right now. Those inhibitory neurotransmitters, GABA, glycine, it's kind of like the, the parking brake there on your cells. It's keeping them from doing anything when you don't need them to do something. Glycine, glycine uh, is inhibitory in the part of your nervous system that's going to make your muscles to contract. This is actually best uh, illustrated when we look at things that disrupt function of either glycine or GABA. We have a an antagonist of glycine called strychnine. Strychnine is a notorious poison. Back in the day, strychnine would be used to kill people, and, and when you have a, a person that's been killed by strychnine poisoning, all their muscles will contract, including the facial muscles, so usually their eyes are open and they're smiling. Because strychnine is an antagonist of glycine. It stops that inhibition, and if you don't have inhibitory, then what you end up with is excitatory. GABA. Actually, we can look at GABA the other direction. Things that are GABA agonists include Things like propofol. Propofol is an anesthetic. If you've ever seen propofol, it's kind of a white liquid, and it is magic. When you hook it up to a patient's IV, they are unconscious. When you turn it off, give them a few minutes, and they'll be conscious again. It's a GABA agonist, and it binds to that GABA receptor, and it shuts down parts of the brain. It, it just... Not permanently by any means. It just makes them harder to fire. So you get unconsciousness. Now, you're probably going to stop breathing as well, which is why patients that are being given propofol are put on a ventilator. That's why Michael Jackson died. It's by no means a drug to treat insomnia. It's a serious anesthetic. Often, instead of that, what we see is... Another drug that is an allosteric agonist of GABA. Now remember these receptors for these neurotransmitters are three-dimensional proteins. So you've got this blob shape, and you've got like the slot where GABA is going to fit. So GABA is going to fit there in the slot, right? It's a perfectly like GABA-shaped slot. GABA is the only thing that's going to fit there. But over here on the side, you've got another little divot where something else can fit. That's the allosteric site. And an allosteric agonist means that when the protein binds to this other molecule, it changes the shape enough where it makes it easier for GABA to bind. The thing that we're talking about right now is a chemical called ethanol. 
which you should be familiar with at this point in your life. Probably you're in college. Ethanol is green alcohol. Everclear, for instance, is nearly pure ethanol. And what happens as you drink that ethanol binds to that allosteric site and the resting membrane potential of those neurons starts to go down. And like I said, if you've ever been drunk, you're aware of this. You can make that neuron fire. You can make that thought happen. It takes longer to get there. Your reflexes slow down. You'll dodge a second after an object hits you in the face. Or swerve a second after you hit a telephone pole. The filter on your uh, thought to mouth is gone. It's inhibited drink too much and you might go the same route as like propofol and you might inhibit breathing. But that's GABA. Now if we blocked GABA and for whatever reason this does exist, there is a GABA antagonist, what you get is a seizure. And so there's really not a purpose for that. Our other two amino acid neurotransmitters that we talked about are glutamate and aspartate. Glutamate is the most abundant excitatory neurotransmitter in the nervous system. It plays the major role in activating neurons. It is super important. It's how neurons talk to neurons. In most chemical synapses, glutamate is involved in learning and memory. Um, there's so many functions for glutamate and, and we really just don't have time to get into them all. One of the things that, that is key to uh, glutamate is that in high levels it can actually kill neurons. This is called excitotoxicity. And this is one of the proposed mechanisms for a disease called uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. And we'll talk about that later when we look at some pathophys. Uh, aspartate, also an excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, not as abundant as glutamate. So those are your amino acids. Now we'll move forward to our next class of neurotransmitter. Our next class of neurotransmitter are the monoamines. Now here we get into this realm of neurotransmitters that you've probably heard of. These include dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin, Histamine. Lots of function here. They're found in both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, but these tend to have metabotropic receptors. Metabotropic means it's not just going to open an ion channel, it's going to trigger a chain reaction inside the cell. It uses a second messenger system. to trigger this big chain reaction in the cell. And monoamines are removed in a different way. Monoamines are removed by reuptake, and then they're broken down by an enzyme called monoamine oxidase. So let's look at that idea, reuptake and breakdown. So here you have our presynaptic neuron, we have our postsynaptic neuron. So that presynaptic neuron releases our neurotransmitter out here, and it's going to get sucked back up in there. That is reuptake. Monoamine oxidase, or MAO, then breaks it down so it can't go back out. Now, we can take advantage of this system. 
um, some of these neurotransmitters, serotonin, for instance, is associated with mood, among other things. And we can use antidepressants to change the way serotonin is released or change the way serotonin is broken down. If you ever see the term MAOI, that's a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. It blocks that enzyme. So then you get reuptake and that neurotransmitter goes straight back out. Unfortunately, it's monoamine oxidase inhibitor, not serotonin oxidase inhibitor. So that means it affects all the monoamines, not just serotonin. So today, we use a more specific type of antidepressant called an SSRI. That is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Selectively blocks the reuptake of serotonin so that that serotonin stays out here in the synapse longer and you're less depressed. This would be your major antidepressants like Prozac and Effexor and Zoloft and Lexapro. There are newer uh, versions of the SNRI, which is selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, and other things. Um, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine we'll spend some time with because they're parts of the autonomic nervous system. Dopamine is associated with lots of different things in the brain. Um, addiction. Um movement, voluntary movement, pleasure, reward. There are lots of things here for, for dopamine in the brain, and we'll have time to look at some of those. The last class of neurotransmitters that we care about are called the neuropeptides. Now, these neurotransmitters are more complicated. They have lots of stuff going on. These would include things like uh, endorphins, um, let's see, um, something called substance P. It's the worst name for a neurotransmitter ever. Um, orexin. Among other things. Um, so. Let's see, uh, endorphins actually inhibit pain, or they block pain. The word endorphin means endogenous morphine. We actually didn't discover endorphins, we discovered morphine or opium, I suppose. And at some point, someone realized there has to be a, a mechanism for this. And as we'll see later when we talk about illicit drugs, they're not doing anything novel in your body. They're just taking advantage of a mechanism that already exists. Substance P transmits pain. Are the neurons that send pain back to the brain? That's what, how they're going to talk. Orexin is an important neurotransmitter that is involved in both hunger, satiation, and the sleep-wake cycle. Uh, we actually have a medication out of the market now, um, Belsomra. Ask your doctor about prescription Belsomra. Belsomra is an orexin antagonist, and it makes you super sleepy. Uh, people that have narcolepsy, it's an autoimmune disease that attacks that, and, and they're lacking that neurotransmitter in the brain, so they don't have a sleep-wake cycle. Um, there's... Uh, bouts of sleep and awake and uh, anytime you block that orexin or you lose it in the case of narcoleptics 
and you're going to be super sleepy. All right, so these are neuropeptides, super complicated. There's lots of them, and we're not going to get into the depths of them. Um, wide functions here. So those are our four classes of neurotransmitters, and, and some of them that we care about. We'll talk about some of them in specifics later, especially acetylcholine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, when we get to the autonomic nervous system. So that's where we'll stop with, with neurotransmitters. And we'll come back and look at the brain in two parts, the spinal cord, and then the nerves. So if you're following along, the next thing that you should be looking at is the brain, part one.